Hello, I'm Clarence Schuler. Uh, some people call me the love doctor. I'm the president and CEO of Building Lasting Relationships. And due to this virus, what's really been amazing to me is that I'm hearing reports all around the world that couples are struggling in their marriage because they're spending so much more time together than they normally would do. And what that's doing is causing a lot of conflict. And I want to talk about how to win at conflict as a couple. So let me share the first thing. What are some common causes for conflict? Well, the first one could be really be external. So it could be our hunger. It could be if we're angry. It could be lonely or if we're tired. All those things can stop communication. Uh, my wife Brenda is so funny because she says, you know, she needs to eat. And uh, she said when she feels that hunger coming on, two things are going to happen. She's going to get frustrated or she might get a headache. So we make sure we feed her so she doesn't get a headache and we don't have other consequences. But if we're hungry or angry or lonely or tired, that can really hurt our communication. And remember, communication is to marriage, location is to real estate. We need to communicate, 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 assume nothing and talk about everything. Well, there are some other sources of conflict. Uh, our family upbringing, you know, where you came from, single family, family with two parents, in you know, a blended family. We grow up with, whatever we grew up with, that's what we know. And we share what we know with our spouse. And what's funny, they grew up in a totally different place and we all bring baggage into the marriage relationship. A lot of times we just don't realize that we brought baggage into a relationship. So that's important. Also, some other source of conflict can be previous relationships, whether it's dating or previous marriage. All those things make a difference. Uh, when I married my wife, Brenda, I called them very wealthy. She would say they were upper middle class, but she married me and we weren't poor. We were poor. We couldn't afford the last O and R. You know, uh, it's so funny. The first dinner that I had with Brenda's house, they had these little white things under the fork. I had no idea what they were. And then after, you know, people would start eating, they would take these little things up and they would, you know, put them inside our mouth. And, and at home, we were so poor, we, we would just take our arm and just wipe our mouth. <laughs> so we were really different. And I remember hearing the mother say, honey, he's rude, crude, and socially unacceptable. Are you going to be okay with him? So we're just radically different. And so it's different perspectives on marriage relationships. And people might not realize that we have differing perspectives. And so sometimes what I mean by that, we may think that our point of view is the only point of view, but now we're married to someone and he or she thinks totally different than we do. And another cause for chaos is that men and women are wired differently. You know, women use all of their brain. Uh, we as men, we, we, use, we use our brain too, but we have the gift of a nothing box. And most women don't have a nothing box. This is going all the time. And I actually feel sorry for them because I can actually, my wife can say, what are you thinking about? I can say nothing and really mean nothing. But she's always going, you know, until she drops in bed. So that's funny too. But men and women are wired differently. We think about sex differently. What motivates us, what stimulates us for sex. So all those things can create chaos. But if a couple works together, you can always have the marriage that you've always wanted if you're willing to work for it. So let's think about these, uh, thinking that we only have our own perspective or thinking that have preconceived notions. The other thing is, can be a lack of understanding. And the lack of understanding can come when we're not focused on hearing what our spouse is trying to say to us. You know, sometimes when we're having conflict, we're not really listening, we're just reloading. You know, we're waiting for an opportunity for our spouse to be quiet so we can give our point across and let them know they're wrong and that we're right and they should listen to us. Well, that really does not help a couple become closer and work through conflict. Because if one of you wins, quote, the fight, you lose as a couple. So working through conflict is not about winning. It's really about understanding and then processing that as a couple. In fact, it's really seeing the problem as the enemy and you and your spouse on the same side. So when you have a problem, you and your spouse don't attack each other, you attack the problem, say, what's best for us as a couple is how we're gonna deal with this problem. So I wanna encourage you when you think about conflict, don't start thinking the next time conflict comes and typically conflict will arise, don't think about winning or losing, think about how can we process this as a couple and how can we win as we do that. Now, typically there are four responses to conflict. There's the yield, and the problem with yielding is that um, you feel like you get walked on all the time and you start just stuffing it. 
or we have to win at all costs. That means that you have to be right no matter what, and so you become really insensitive. Or you withdraw. Now, when you withdraw, you lose leverage because you run away or go somewhere, slam a door, leave the house, leave the room, whatever. But when you come back, you've lost all your leverage when you, when you withdraw. So the best way to respond to conflict is to figure out how can we resolve the conflict. So here's the deal. When we're wounded by our spouse, we typically respond in one of two ways. Either we stuff it, like a person who's yielding or a person who's withdrawal, we, we stuff it, or we have a hair trigger and we just blow up. And sometimes we don't blow up right away. You know, sometimes we stuff it for a while because the problem with stuffing, eventually it's going to come out. And so when we our spouse least expect it, they um, do the last, they they break the last straw, whatever it is. And you shouldn't have a last straw to be broken, but we break that last straw and our spouse goes off and we go like, what happened? And they've kept a record of all things we've done wrong for I don't know telling how long. Do you know that sometimes when people have conflict, uh, they usually don't get hysterical, they just get historical. You know, so everything that's happened in the past, they bring up, which means that you've never solved those issues. So you tend to have reoccurring problems as you process and try and work through this conflict. So if we're going to resolve conflict, we need to understand this. One, that conflict is reality. So the goal of marriage is not to be conflict free, but to work through conflict. Because when we try to avoid conflict, we're actually avoiding reality. And here's something too I want you to think about. When we work through conflict correctly, we actually develop a closer relationship with our spouse or spouse to be. Now think about that. Working through conflict correctly can actually bring you closer. And so, well, Clarence, why would you say that? Well, when we work through conflict, I hear and learn one thing or two from Brenda that's really important to her that I didn't realize was that important before. And I just kind of put it in my hard drive and say, hey, that's really important. So I'm going to start being a better husband to her in the context of knowing that this particular issue is really important to her. Or she, during the conflict, begins to learn, hey, this is really important to Clarence. I didn't know it's that important, but now... From here on out, as we're dealing with stuff, I will have that in mind as I work with him. So what happens is when you handle conflict correctly, you learn something about each other that maybe you didn't realize before. And here's the other thing. It makes you closer. You know, it makes you closer. You become a better husband and a better wife because now you know more about your spouse and how to be a better wife or better husband to him or to her. So we have to really work at this whole idea of improving conflict. And the key thing in improving conflict is really learn to hear each other. Uh, that's a thing that's called the floor. Uh, Scott Stanley in Denver has created a whole deal about that, so I want to talk about it. But the premises of this is that you give you one of the other the floor. It could be a telephone or anything. You say, honey, you're going to be the speaker. I'm going to listen, and I'm going to paraphrase what I hear you say and make sure we get in the same way and get in the same understanding. Now, why do we do that? It gives each one of us, a husband and wife, a chance to share two or three things, keep it very short, that you want to express to your spouse. Then your spouse expresses back to you what they feel they've heard, which gives you the option as a speaker to say, hey, that's exactly what I meant. Or if they didn't get it right, you say, no, that's not what I meant. You don't say you got it wrong, but you say, hey, let me rephrase it. And you say it in a way that he or she can receive or understand what you're saying. And that begins to do uh, lower the conflict. The other thing, when you use this process of using the floor and have a speaker listener technique, it takes more of the emotion out of it. You become more, more objective, really trying to get to the truth and understand as opposed to winning the fight. So I want to encourage you to, to, to think about that the next time you have an issue. And then once the speaker is done saying what he or she needs to say, they hand the floor over to the other person and then you can respond and then they respond, reciprocate. And it seems really simple, but it really works and it's great. And it really lowers the emotion as you're working through conflict. And this process is really important when you don't talk about major things. It's not when you're trying to figure out if you want to go to McDonald's or Wendy's. It's for things that are really major and really, really important. Well, another thing as we work through conflict is understand the anatomy of anger. In the anatomy of anger, we have a partner's offense. Now, when we have a partner's offense, that usually leads to a hurt. And most hurts, uh, if they're not healed, can lead to anger. So you have a partner's offense that leads to a hurt, 
if that hurt is not healed, you know, it leads to anger. Anger is almost always a secondary emotion. Now, if you're the one who gets hurt, it's your responsibility, not your spouse's or spouse's to be, because they may not know they've hurt you. When you're wounded, you need to tell your spouse, you need to be like a yellow caution light. Hey, what you just said or what you just did hurt me. And you, you express that. And when you express that, uh, that's really important. It opens the door for reconciliation. Now, before we get to reconciliation, when you have anger, your anger needs to be controlled. If your anger is uncontrolled, that's when people slam doors, leave the house, cuss each other out, do all kinds of stuff. None of that's profitable. But if you have controlled anger, and being anger is not a sin, it doesn't mean you're wrong or bad, it's just, it's just an emotion. But when you control and say, hey, what you just did bothered me and explain why it did, then it helps your spouse say, oh, I didn't realize I hurt you, or I'm so sorry I did that. That's important. And once that's on the table and your spouse knows there's a problem, then that opens the door for reconciliation. When you're having reconciliation, that opens the door for forgiveness or they're also solving the problem. And all those happen under reconciliation. So now, because sometimes people forgive right away or they work through the problem where the problem is and then they forgive. But no matter what it happens, now it's on the table. Now both of you can deal with it. Now you both, because you both now know there's an issue that needs to be dealt with to begin with. Now that takes us to this uh, transparency. And the transparency uh, it's like you were before you even got married or early in your marriage. I mean, there's nothing between you. And I think that's so, so important. Uh, let me share something with you. You know, years ago, uh, before I got married, um, I got addicted to pornography. And I remember uh, I was addicted about 11 years, you know, total. And finally, I got delivered from my pornography. And my wife never knew that I was addicted. And finally, one time, I just went and told her, I said, you know, honey, uh, I want you to know I'm not addicted now, but I used to be addicted to pornography. And I told her that. And some of my homeboys said, why in the world did you tell your wife you're addicted to pornography? And she didn't know. I said, well, you know, I probably didn't do it the best way. I just dumped everything on her. But I said, I didn't want anything between us. I wanted to be transparent. I didn't want to try and keep up a lie or anything like that. So for her to know that, even though it was hard for her to hear, I want to know she can trust me. I want to know my heart. So there's nothing between us. And that's really critical for me as I spend time with Brendan, as we grow together in relationships. So you have that transparency. That's also a part of the anatomy of overcoming the anger. And then last, the intimacy. And, you know, when most guys hear intimacy, we think in sex. And that's not a bad thing. But intimacy here means closeness. And my wife, when she was speaking to a group of men or women, women see intimacy totally different. It's closeness. It doesn't have to have sex. It can include sex, but it doesn't have to ha have it. And some women, we don't know who created this or said this first, but intimacy, really, intimacy actually is often said, into me see. And that's where we have that closeness that comes from that transparency, that oneness. So when we have the anatomy of anger, we have a partner's offense that leads to a hurt, that leads to controlled anger, opens the door for reconciliation. Under reconciliation, we have forgiveness, we have transparency, and then we have intimacy. So these are really key factors in understanding the anatomy of anger the next time those happen. Now, here's something to think about. We tend to struggle with being angry. And so ask yourself, what causes you to get angry? Now, remember, anger is not a sin. And sometimes people fake anger to avoid conflict. So ask yourself, what's the one thing that gets you angry? more than anything else. Or, 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 or maybe before you talk to yourself, ask, why do you think most people get angry? You know, what do you think that is? And maybe you have this conversation with your spouse. And then come home and say, why do you get angry? What really gets in your crawl? What, what gets you upset? What, what are your trigger points? And then the other question is, should those things or whatever it is, you know, make you angry? So, uh, so keep that in mind as, as we process there. Uh, now, no matter how angry you get, there's no place in marriage for emotional or physical abuse. There's no place in marriage for emotional or physical abuse. If you need counseling, please go to counseling. And it doesn't mean you're a weak man or a weak woman to have counseling and get help. It, it just helps you hear yourself and get to know yourself better. But again, there's no place in the relationship for any kind of abuse like that. Uh, one of my friends, Bob Horner, says, the measure of man or woman is what it takes to make them angry. And so... 
Again, anger is not a sin, but you want to make sure that you're controlled your emotions in regards to your relationships when things come and happen. And the more that Brenda and I talk, the less anger we tend to get. But anger is a natural emotion, but we really try to work on controlling that. And the more we talk, uh, the more we spend time together, the more we listen to each other, the less issues we have with, angry and, with anger and our conflict goes down. But because both of us, neither one of us are perfect, and because we both continue to grow and we don't have a perfect marriage, we will continue to have to work through conflict periodically from here, from, you know, as we keep going in our marriage. Well, I think it's important when you're dealing with anger or dealing with conflict that we really keep short accounts. There's a verse in the Bible, Ephesians 5:26, I think 4:26 says, uh, don't let the sun go down your anger or in your wrath. And so what it really means is keep short accounts. I don't know about you, but if Brenda and I are angry and we don't resolve our conflict that night, the next day it actually gets worse. You know, because I, I've thought of more things of why she's not what she should be, and 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 that's not really good. But if we keep a short account, that's really important. Now, as Brenda and I work through our conflict, uh, <laughs> you know, she's learned that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Now, you say, why do you say that? Well, think about this. Now, I'm African-American, but some of my friends who are Caucasian or light of complexion, when they get upset, their face can get red. They can be laughing with their face. And, and, and why does their face get red? Because the blood goes to it. And so here's the deal. When Brenda feeds me, it's hard. My, my blood goes to digest the food. And so it's almost physiologically impossible for me to get upset after she's fed me. So if we've had conflict on the phone before I get home or if we've had conflict, you know, and I, I just get back to the house for some reason, if there is a grilled salmon, broccoli, black eyed, bees, black eyed peas and corn together, and that's a sweet potato pie, either I've been really good, it's going to be a really long night. <laughs> but uh, she'll feed me, but then we'll sit down and we'll talk and we'll work through those processes. So we have a lot of fun with that. So when my girls were home, they would say, Dad, leave, leave, you're in trouble. So they would keep me, keep me out of trouble. But anyway, uh, that's important for us to understand. But, but really keep short accounts. Don't let things go on and on. Because if you have kids in the house, they can sense the tension between mom and dad. And a lot of times when mom and dad have tension, the kids think it's their fault. And so we don't want to transfer that to them because they naturally take that on. So that's important. A key factor in dealing with conflict is that we have to speak the truth in love. Well, what does that mean? When we try to speak the truth in love uh, to our spouse or to our boyfriend or girlfriend, it means we sit down with them. And I would encourage you, if possible, sit down with them. Let them have a chair right in front of you. Look in their eyes. If possible, maybe hold their hands. Or put your hands on your knees and say, honey, um, we need to talk. Now, ladies, when you tell us as men, we need to talk. Most men, not all men, but most of us, we, we translate that. We hear in our filter, I did something wrong. But guys, don't go there right away. But when she says, or when, the ladies, when we say to you that, hey, we need to talk, uh, I need to tell you something. Here's how you do that. As you speak the truth in love, it is critical that we say three things that they've done well. Three positive things they've done well before we tell them the one negative thing. Now, when you have to tell, speak the truth in love, don't tell everything you know one thing. Tell them three things they did well, then the one thing. Because when they hear three things, they say, well, she really cares or he really cares. They're not trying to blow me away. And, hey, I am doing some things okay, That's, which is great. Okay, I'm ready to hear the negative thing. And then you tell them the negative thing it is much easier to receive. They don't think that you're being unrealistic because you said three good things they've done or they're doing versus the one thing. And it, it's a positive deal and it's encouraging. And eventually, if you do it that way, they say, OK, well, you're really trying to help me out. You're not trying to take advantage of me. You're not trying to put me down. You're not trying to dominate this relationship. It took me a while. But when I Brenda began to give me constructive criticism, what helped me receive the criticism? I hate the criticism. I hate for her to tell me stuff I do wrong. But what helps me to receive is knowing she's on my side, that she's trying to make me as good as I can be and that she loves me. And so the fact I know she loves me, the, track, the fact she's on my side and trying to make me as good as I can be, that makes it easier, not easy, but easier to receive any kind of constructive criticism. And the same thing I do with her. Also, time is important. You know, when she comes home, 
you know, from work, I don't blast her as soon as she walks through the door. I, I'm a writer, so I work out of my house. And, you know, she doesn't do the same thing with me. We talk about, how's your day? We try and share three things that happened during the day. And not things that happened, but how we felt about it. Because that lets our emotions involved. And guys, it's really important for us because as we share with our, our wives, not just what happened, not just the facts, but how we feel about it, what that does, it lowers the stress in our life. Some of us guys, we just keep all this stress. We have heart attacks and strokes because we keep everything in. We don't have any place to give it out. Our time with our wife and husband should be a safe place and a great place for us to have oneness together where... You know, we can say anything. Doesn't mean anybody agrees with everything, but we can say anything and know we're still loved. So let me encourage that. That was free. I just want to throw that in. But how we speak the truth and love. Again, we share three positive things, one negative thing. And again, we're not trying to give them a piece of our mind. We're not trying to win the argument. We're not trying to put them down. But we're just very concerned about them and want them to be the best they can do. So we don't need to use abusive language or, or anything like that but that's important. And if we handle conflict correctly, uh, that can lead us to forgiveness. And here, let me, let me share this concept with you. So often when people are having conflict and we talk about forgiveness, people tend to think, well, I'll forgive you when I feel better. That's not really a good way to look at it. From a biblical perspective, really, that doesn't work either. But no matter where you're a person of faith or not, Forgiveness is really more of an action than an attitude or a feeling. You know, and so what we need to do is say, and forgiveness doesn't mean we forget what they did. Forgiveness does not alleviate or eliminate accountability or responsibility. But forgiveness, once we've talked through things, it, it, what it does, we treat them as though they've never done it before. We become vulnerable to them. And as we become vulnerable to them and they become vulnerable to us, that's how we grow together. And so forgiveness, when we can actually resolve it, it doesn't keep coming back up because one sign your conflict is never resolved is that it keeps coming back up. You really haven't resolved it. You haven't ended it. And so it, and ended it, that, that means you don't talk about it, but now you have a good understanding. And let me say this too. Even if you're right in this conflict, wherever it is, Ask yourself, why did I get so upset about something, quote, even if I'm right about it, why, I get so, why, why is it so emotional for me to deal with that? And that may help you have a chance to do some self-evaluation and process where you are and where you're coming from. But I think we need to process that when we have conflict, that's not a bad thing. I have to look at the big picture myself and that when Brent and I have conflict, I know on the other side, we're going to be better and closer together. Even though, and so that gives me the courage and the strength to walk through where that conflict is at that particular time. And you may need to schedule your conflict. You know, uh, one of you wants to deal with it right away. Another one wants to say, hey, I don't want to do it. I need time to process. I recommend giving the person who needs to process it an hour, two hours, at the most 24 hours to process whatever you need to do. And if you want to deal with it right away, you know that in an hour or two, or at very least, the, the most, the next day, you're gonna talk about it and it's gonna get resolved. That way it doesn't go on and on and on forever, but you deal with it. And so I think couples who use some of these principles will actually learn how to win as couples at conflict. And two things will happen. You, look, you won't fear conflict when it arises. You'll get closer as a result of conflict. And honestly, if you use these principles, you'll actually find yourself having less conflict as a couple. I hope that works for you. God bless.